Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this beautiful, at least where I am in Northeast, a beautiful, feels like spring day after a very long winter. Well, thanks for joining part four of How to Litigate a Medical Malpractice Case Series. Today, we're going to talk about discovery and depositions. Before we get into it, I just want to give a brief pitch for the New York State Academy of Trial Lawyers, an organization I hold near and dear, having been a past president and lecturing regularly and being an active board member, where yesterday I was joined by other past presidents, uh, where we interviewed the slate of Court of Appeals uh, nominees, uh, which is quite a good slate. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully we'll be hearing soon on our next chief judge of the New York State Court of Appeals. If you're not a member of the Academy, please join. Uh, if you've enjoyed the CLEs for free, uh, just by attending today, you get $50 off the membership. And once you're a member, you have access to all the CLEs pretty much ever done in the last many, many years on demand. Uh, you can get on committees, you can really get involved, help change the law. And it's just a fantastic organization, which is why I'm so proud to be a part of it. So I encourage you to join if you're not a member already. Just to go over a few ground rules, as most of you know, since I think you've probably attended one of my CLEs before, is that we will go from now until two o'clock uh, and then the last half hour from 2 to 2.30 uh, is all for Q&A. I encourage you to stay on. You can get an additional credit or half credit, uh, I believe, for uh, the extra 30 minutes in certain jurisdictions. And a lot of good stuff happens in the Q&A. Uh, here on Zoom, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little area that says Q&A. Anybody can enter questions, comments, feedback. I encourage that. I am quick to remind everybody that I do not profess to know everything. There's a lot more that I don't know than I do know, but I'm here to share with you what I do know and what, have, what has helped me and our firm over the last few decades uh, in the cases we've been involved in. And if you take one thing away from today's CLE, then I think it's worthwhile. That's always my perspective when I attend uh, CLEs pr presented by other people. So today we're going to talk about discovery and depositions in a medical malpractice case. To be clear, the focus today is on medical malpractice cases. I've already talked uh, in a prior program back in 2021, I did a CLE on how to litigate a personal injury case where there was a section on discovery and there was a section on preparing and conducting depositions. So I encourage you to take a look at that. It was in April of 2021 that we talked about depositions. That same material can be found in the book that you just saw a spot for uh, that I just published, which is based on that series. There's a lot of really good information in there and all the proceeds go to uh, my charitable causes, which can be found at thementoresq.com, as well as all the prior CLEs and materials can be found there as well. All right. So... Discovery, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on today, but the bulk of it's going to be on depositions. Discovery in a medical malpractice case is frankly not that extensive as far as I'm concerned, as it may be in many other types of cases where you need all kinds of information. What we like to do at our firm in medical malpractice cases is to send out our regular demands, discovery demands as plaintiffs, um, that will have a demand for insurance policies, demand for experts, uh, demand for photos and videos of our clients, uh, lots of standard, what I call sort of boilerplate demands. In a medical malpractice case, really what I look for and I request in addition to the standard demands, and I encourage anybody that uh, has any specific demands that they like to serve, in medical malpractice cases for the plaintiff or the defense to mention that in the Q&A. But generally, we like to get all the medical records from that named party. So if it's a case where we've sued one hospital or two hospitals or a practice group or individual doctors or a mix of all, you have to have separate demands for each defendant. Okay, that's a question that comes up quite a bit. Do I serve one for... Um, all the doctors at this hospital, they all have one counsel. Can I just serve one demand? The proper way to do it, in my opinion, is to serve specific demands for every named party. And as we spoke about in a prior uh, part on commencing the action, 
where I said, I don't agree that you name the whole laundry list of every single doctor and nurse you see in a medical chart. Um, I doubt you're gonna be able to serve demands on every single party if you list it that way. If you fine tune your complaint to name those parties who legitimately may be culpable, uh, then you can tailor your demands to those specific defendants, if you're a plaintiff, because they're each gonna have different roles to play. Uh, I'll talk today, I'll continue to talk about the case I had, the death case involving uh, propofol infusion syndrome. And in that case, we had two hospitals. I think we had four or five different um, medical providers, whether it be a, a nurse practitioner who was involved, uh, different physicians at the different facilities. So we had an anesthesiologist, we had an ICU physician, um, critical care doctors. So the demands, the records may be different. They may be the same, but you're gonna to wanna to send different demands on each named defendant, okay, if you're a plaintiff. If you're on the defense side, and shout out to all my defense colleagues, I took a quick look through the list of everyone and I see that there are some uh, of my adversaries that defend hospitals and doctors here and uh, also lots of other plaintiff's lawyers. Many of you can be giving this lecture instead of me, uh, so I hopefully I'll be doing my best for you. But in my demands, the additional ones, I always wanna get the medical records from that specific provider. Now, as a background, as we talked about, you've hopefully obtained those records already uh, by sending for them, to review them, to make sure that you have a case as a plaintiff to bring. But then you want to get the actual records from those doctors, hospitals, medical centers, uh, facilities, uh, so that you could see what copy the doctors have and the hospitals have. And then you can compare it with what you have. You sometimes get nice tidbits there. Maybe something's missing from the record that is served upon you on discovery, but was in your set. Maybe something additional is there that wasn't in your set. Uh, maybe the records look a little different or maybe there's just no difference at all, which is the majority of the time. But you always wanna request the records uh, and you want to compare them with what you have. So I look at insurance policies. I wanna see what kind of coverage there is involved. Again, always request the full policies, not just the amount of coverage, which is usually what's disclosed. Um, get the full policies in a medical malpractice case. You're gonna to wanna to see if there's a consent policy which means if you've named a physician, whether that physician has the right uh, to say, no, no, we're not settling, I'm not giving consent. So you wanna see if that's what you're dealing with. You wanna see which policies are covering which defendants in the case. So I really like to get the policies, which you're entitled to. And I like to get the medical records. And then lastly, I really focus on requesting the curriculum vitae. And we'll talk about how I suggest you go about using the curriculum vitae, otherwise known as a resume, uh, for any individual doctors uh, that are named in the complaint. Um, of course, depending on your specific case, you're going to want to demand um, imaging, whether that's x-rays, MRI films, whether it's specific lab results, specific biopsy results. Most of these items should be disclosed when you request all of the records, um, but this is one of the reasons why I suggest you have your experts on board early because you may have an expert who say, I really wanna see the respiratory flow sheets in this case. I didn't see them in the chart that you sent me that you obtained, so request that. Speak with your experts early, ask them if they believe there's anything missing from the records you obtained and provided, anything they'd like to see, anything that you should ask for that you may not even be aware of. That's one of the reasons you get your experts on early and you put those in your discovery demands. Another thing I just want to touch on in discovery demands is plaintiffs will often get served with a demand for something called an ARONS authorization, A-R-O-N-S, which is based on an ARONS case. And those authorizations uh, are usually demanded by counsel for the hospitals and the doctors. And it's a little different than a regular HIPAA authorization for the release of medical records, which are usually... Uh, freely uh, exchanged. And Aaron's authorization uh, is something that the defense is allowed to serve on the plaintiff that gives the defense attorney's authorization to speak to treating doctors. And it's really interesting. There's been a decent amount of litigation 
But the bottom line is, is as a plaintiff, you have to provide it. You have to provide the authorization. The authorization allows counsel for the hospitals and the physicians to call up a doctor, to send them the authorization and follow it up with a phone call or schedule a call. Say, I'd like to have an ex parte call with you without anybody else around and talk about your treatment uh, of the injuries alleged that are specific in this pending medical malpractice case. And at first, uh, members of the bar, we were all uh, somewhat shocked, or some of us were, at least on the plaintiff side, wait, what, they can just call up and speak to, uh, we have to give them these authorizations to speak to our clients treating doctors? So the answer is yes, you do have to give them. However, the authorizations are tailored to make it very clear in the language of them to the doctor, the treating doctor, and it says in the authorization, um, you do not need to speak with this. This is for defense counsel in a case that the plaintiff is bringing. You are not obligated to cooperate, okay? So it's saying you can, I'm allowing you to under the HIPAA laws, but you don't have to participate. And you can even highlight that language. I didn't include an Aaron's authorization in the materials, but very easy, type in Google, Aaron's, A-R-O-N-S, authorizations. I think the second link, I just tried it out, that'll pop up, will be from the uh, New York State court system. And that will have a sample Aaron's authorization, which is perfectly good to use. What I like to do is literally with a highlighter on the computer, highlight the language saying, this is for defense counsel defending the case that your patient is bringing and you do not need to speak to them. So just be on the lookout for Aaron's authorizations. You do have to exchange them under the law. And that's something that's a little different that you will generally see in a medical malpractice case, although they're not limited. Uh, Aaron's authorizations can be demanded, I believe, in any type of case. So be on the lookout for Aaron's authorizations. So as far as discovery, again, I'd, I'd refer you back to my prior um, lectures and materials on items that you need to demand. But generally, those are the main things, medical records, the CV. If you're bringing a case against a hospital or medical center, I always like to request their guidelines. Sometimes they have them, sometimes they don't. So for example, in my propofol case, we demanded from the hospitals any guidelines they have, any rules within the facilities for the administration of propofol, uh, for the administration of narcotics. Uh, so you wanna request, make sort of, you can make them kind of broad uh, at first. If you can tailor your demands to be as narrow as possible, that's always the best and will avoid motion practice. Um, lastly, I like to demand communications between any of the defendants and the plaintiff. Some of that may not go into a medical record or chart. Maybe the client, you're, you don't even know, your plaintiff's counsel and your client sent them a letter about something um, and it didn't make its way into the chart. Maybe the physician or someone called on behalf of the physician uh, and recorded something as far as a, a communication with the plaintiff. So you will obviously want to get any emails uh, notes of phone calls, any type of correspondence or communications between any of the defendants and the plaintiff to the extent they're in the possession of the defendants. Also, depending on the case, contracts, there may be contracts between the hospital and the doctors, maybe their attending physicians. You may want to see what the obligations are, the duties. So that's all fair game uh, to demand. And, um, and so I would suggest that you consider all those demands and we're not going to talk too much more about discovery uh, from the defense side. You're obviously always going to want to demand authorizations. You're going to want to ask for all the records in the plaintiff's possession. You're also going to want to ask for any communications, any recordings. Uh, in my propofol case, my clients, um, the, the, the client was the wife of the man who passed away. She would record conversations in the hospital because not because she was a litigation happier even was contemplating that, but it was a situation where she was so overwhelmed with what was going on that she found that she wouldn't be able to keep track of what the, all the different physicians were telling her about the situation and treatment uh, regarding her husband. So she would use the recording feature on her phone. That ended up being pretty interesting. Some of the information that we got from those audio recordings. So of course we had to share those. I wanted to share those even if it wasn't demanded, 
But if you're a counsel for doctors or a hospital, you're definitely want to going to want to put in your boilerplate demands, you know, any audio, video, other recordings of any communications uh, between the, you know, the hospital, the hospital's employees, the doctors, and the plaintiff, uh, because it'll be interesting what you may find from those. Okay, so. Um, that is generally what I want to talk about with discovery. I know it's pretty short, but we have about 40 minutes left. And depositions in a medical malpractice case are super important. For those of you listening to the podcast at home, the first verification code is POD444. Again, the code for the first verification on the podcast is POD, like podcast, 444. So let's talk about depositions in a medical malpractice case. And again, I'm going to focus on the preparation because if you've listened to me ever talk, I preach preparation, preparation, preparation. Actually, a friend of mine I saw the other night who's not an attorney um, was excited that I, I wrote this book and he said he's actually going to read it, which I was surprised anybody who's not a lawyer would even consider reading it. And then when I saw him, he said to me, I think I get it. It's all about preparation, right? I said, that's it, man. That's what we do. You have to prepare. It's all the behind the scenes work that um, most people don't realize goes into being successful uh, when you are a trial attorney and you're litigating these types of cases. And no more is that needed than in a medical malpractice case. We've been talking about how to prepare. You've already started at the beginning with the records and your experts. And now you're getting to the point where you're getting ready to question a physician uh, with regard to what uh, may or may not have been medical malpractice in the case. And you must, must, must prepare in depth at length for these depositions. This is not an auto accident deposition or a pedestrian knockdown that you can grab a police report and wing it, you know, that the day of. And I'm gonna walk you through how I prepare to depose a physician so that you can hopefully get some good ideas and assist you in your preparation to get uh, what you need to, and we'll talk about that out of a deposition. So many people wonder, look, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a doctor. How can I go toe to toe questioning a physician? Uh, that physician is gonna talk circles around me. I can't possibly know as much as that physician who does it every day, went to medical school. Um, you know, what am I gonna do? I'll try and do my best. Uh, I'll dance around it. I'll ask some questions from the record. No, no, no. Have some confidence in yourself. We're all lawyers, right? We pass the bar, which means we can study something, we can learn something and we can apply it. And it's frankly what we do on a daily basis as practitioners, always learning always new laws, always new areas, always new issues come up. So what do we do? We study, we learn it, and we apply it. And that's the same exact thing that you need to do to be effective in preparing and conducting a deposition of a physician. You need to learn the area of medicine involved in the case. And it's totally doable. Just because someone is an ICU doctor, the head of an ICU, and I'm gonna talk about that because that's the example I gave you in the materials. The head of an ICU, you wonder, there's no way, how am I gonna know as much as this ICU doctor who's constantly treating patients, who's board certified, who, you know, this is what he or she does. And the answer is just because someone is medically trained or may do uh, a certain, or practice a certain area of medicine on a regular basis, doesn't mean that physician is an expert necessarily in the specific issue in your case, what I'd like to call the area of focus. Just like we're lawyers, and so may say, you know, if I'm going to question Andrew, how can I possibly know everything in the law like he does, but I don't know everything in the law. I can't cite off all the CPLR statutes and what they say and how the laws have interpreted them. There's so much that I, I may know or may not recall, but truth be told, if a lay person decided to open up the CPLR and decide they're going to research everything about one specific provision and how it's been applied and the case law on it, they could probably talk circles around. Me. And that's what 
we all need to do when we're preparing, whether on the plaintiff or defense side, for a deposition of a physician. We need to know the medicine. We need to learn it to be prepared. And we can do it. And how do you do it? Well, first of all, you've already started the process early on. You've gotten the records. We talked about doing your research, learning about the issues, and getting an expert on board early. The first thing that I do when I have the date locked in where I know I'm going to be questioning a physician is I call up my expert and I schedule a meeting. And you must, must, must do this, okay, unless you are so comfortable that you know the medicine cold already, maybe from prior cases. You must schedule a meeting with an expert in the area. Now, as a plaintiff, it's going to be the expert that you brought on board early who reviewed it. As a defense counsel, you may want to just meet with the physician who you are, you are um, defending at the deposition, but I would recommend you meet with an outside expert because just because your client, the defendant, may profess to know everything involved in the ICU and be ready to handle it. No worries, counsel, I got this. There's no way this lawyer is going to know as much as me. This is what I do for a living. Don't be so sure about that. You may want to speak to your outside expert to prepare you for preparing the defendant, for grilling the defendant. How are you going to handle this question? How are you going to handle that question? So I recommend doing it, if possible, in person or by Zoom or by phone. But set up that meeting early on. Record it if you can. The last couple of years, I've been arranging these meetings by Zoom. I ask my expert for permission to record the meeting. I have my list of questions. Usually Michael, my associate, will join in with his list of questions. We'll take notes. We'll record it. And think of the expert as your private tutor. You've retained a great expert, a well-credentialed well -credentialed expert in the field that you're focusing on, who presumably knows a lot about it. And now you have a private tutor. So set up a private tutoring session. So what I did in my propofol case is I met with my um, anesthesia expert, I met with my ICU expert, I met with my propofol expert. These are all the experts I shared with you in the previous uh, parts. And I had Zooms with all of them. And I just acted like a fifth grader. What is that? Why is that? How does that work? Explain it, explain it. And ask questions until you understand it. Don't just nod your head. Don't expect to know things. Learn the medicine. And that's what I did in preparing to question the ICU doctor uh, in the propofol case. I had to learn. I'd never heard about propofol infusion syndrome. I didn't know what it was. So I researched. I found everything I could about it. I read all the studies, all the articles. I got the experts. I had them tutor me, explain for me what it is. What are the signs and symptoms? How is it treated? What do you do? When, when's the doctor supposed to realize it's happening? And you take notes and you learn the medicine, all right? That's what you need to do. Because then by spending the time researching it, reading the materials, studying and having a tutoring session, you're gonna be good to go. And more likely than not, there's a good chance, unless your defendant is the top person in their field in that specific area, which usually isn't the case, sometimes it is, but usually it isn't, there's a good chance you're going to know more when the time comes than that expert is. Because the expert's thinking, uh, the, the defendant uh, is thinking, listen, I do this all the time. I know my stuff. I'm not too worried. I don't know if I mentioned it in this series, or I think I may have mentioned it in another, but think of it like a boxing match, right? Let's say they, they pick me, Andrew, you got to go box against this person. And this person is an amateur boxer. They boxed all the time, right? And they've competed and they've trained. I'm going to say, I'm going to get my ass kicked. I can't box against someone who's trained and had all these matches, right? And on the other side, the boxer saying, oh, I got Andrew Smiley. He's a lawyer. What, what does he know? He's never boxed before in his life. I don't need to do anything. I'm going to show up and knock him on his ass. So he may not prepare, but I'm training every day in the gym. I've got a one-on-one -on -one coach. We've looked at tape. We've researched this other guy. We know when the left hand's going to drop so I can come in with that hook, right? I'm going to be overprepared. I'm going to have studied this person. 
They're not going to care. I'm going to go in and I've got a shot at knocking out the boxer, right? It's the same thing. It's all about preparation. So that's why you need to prepare. All right. So once you've learned the medicine, once you've focused in, I always like to research the physician who I'm going to be questioning. So I start with the curriculum vitae, the CV. If I'm going to be questioning this ICU doctor about propofol infusion syndrome, let's see what he knows. So I look at the CV. I look at the list of publications. Well, I see here they talk about administration of, um, of some other narcotic. I hear they, and I look through and I see they haven't published, as far as I can see, lectured, written on propofol or propofol infusion syndrome. With uh, searches with a PDF these days, if you didn't know, when you open up a chart or a document, you can go into the search function and type in propofol. See, does it come up? Nope, didn't come up once in the CV. It helps you when you look through the chart, which we'll talk about in a moment to prepare. So research, find out. Maybe the defendant has published something on the topic that you're gonna be uh, questioning about. So go online and order or download the article. You can find all these articles, uh, on PubMed, WebMD, you can find this stuff. Um, sometimes you have to pay to join a group to be able to download. Get everything that that expert has published if they have in the area, because you may find stuff that's helpful for you that you can show they wrote about it, but didn't even do what they wrote about, right? Uh, there's lots you can learn. You can see where they did their residency. You could see where they're on staff. You can then look up those hospitals. You can look into their departments online and see if they have materials that may help you in preparing your case. You have to spend the time and dig and dig because there are gems to be found, always gems to be found. And if there's not, maybe there's not always, at least you've tried, all right? So do your research on the doctor, all right? Then after you've done your homework, you've learned the medicine, then you really have to get organized with the medical records, okay? And what I mean by that is you wanna pull up the chart if it was a long admission, you want to pull up the treatment notes. Maybe it was your the plaintiff was going uh, twice a year to this physician for 10 years, and you've got you know 20 dates entered with notes. Maybe there's lab reports. Whatever materials you've reviewed that are relevant to this doctor who you're going to be questioning, meaning they authored a note, or it's a note that they traditionally would look at, or rely upon in forming their opinions or treatment decisions. For example, if it's a hospital case and you're questioning as I'm going to talk about in my propofol case, the ICU doctor, well, I'm allowed to ask that ICU doctor, do you look at these notes from your colleagues, from these other attendings before you take a look at what treatment you're gonna render that day when you show up for your round? Uh, what's your practice? And you'll learn that most physicians that are on rotation, they um, they will look at those notes and they'll tell you, yeah, I want to see, you know, the notes from my colleague. Uh, there's something called a handoff, which can happen in person, but there's also notes in the chart. And so it's fair game to ask, did you read that note? I'm going to draw your attention to it. Did that note have uh, any significance to you? These are questions you want to ask, but you need to know what's out there. You need to know what's in the chart or in the medical records, and you need to read through them as best as you can. Usually you're lucky if it's hospital because they're usually typed up. Uh, they're usually done through a computer system, so they're pretty easy to read. If it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, suing a doctor, maybe in a private practice who handwrites notes, that could be a little bit tricky. What we've done in discovery sometimes is we've asked uh, defense counsel to get that transcribed for us uh, or to identify what those words are in advance of depositions to save us time, uh, which is a, a fair thing to request. I don't know if they're obligated to do it, but if you let them know and you put it in writing, it would be helpful. We can't make out if you can please provide us with a typed up uh, you know, translation of what this chicken scratch is. That will help us move things along in the deposition. Otherwise, you're going to want to ask a physician in a deposition to read every note that you can interpret so you know what's there. Read it slowly. Read it into the record. 
so that you have uh, that information to use for your questioning at that time or to use in the future. And at least so you and your expert will know what that note is. If you have your expert on board early, which I have suggested you do, then that expert sometimes can make, uh, make way with the chicken scratch. Sometimes other physicians can read uh, writing that we can't interpret. They're just used to seeing it. Uh, I'm at fault for my writing too. It's hard to make sense of, but usually someone in my office can interpret it for you. So once you pull all the documents, you need to get organized. And one of the things I love now about using my computer for depositions is I'm not showing up at a deposition with a hospital chart or a stack. I'm able to prepare in advance. I'm able to have the charts. I'm able to save them in different folders on my computer. I can highlight certain sections. I can print uh, on Adobe PDF from a big chart, just those pages and have a separate file on the computer with the relevant page numbers and highlight it. It really helps you move around a lot more quickly. I use double monitors. So I'm looking at the witness uh, with one monitor. Maybe I have my outline right below. Like right now, as I'm speaking to you, I have my outline for this program on the same screen that my camera is. So while it looks like I'm looking at you, I can actually right now look at my outline. And that's what I like to do in depositions. And then if I look to my side, I've got another screen that has my chart and my notes up. Uh, that I can then question the witness and I can share with. So what I'll do is I will organize the medical records in a way that makes sense to me. Sometimes it's a spreadsheet. Sometimes it's handwritten. I'll write it out first and maybe scan it in page and what it says. Um, ultimately, what you want to do is you want to look through the medical records. You want to make note of the important dates of treatment, usually right before the happening of an event, those notes surrounding the event or at the event, and then those notes afterwards. You want to definitely identify every single place in the chart where this witness made a note in the chart because you're going to want to go through that whole chart. Okay, You're going to want to make sure that anything that that witness notated you've asked about, that's the proper way to conduct a deposition to be thorough. And then once you have the chart organized, then that's when you can really get ready to prepare your outline. And I'm going to share with you uh, my screen and show you an example of what I'm talking about. So in the materials on PDF page um, 14, um, you're going to see the following chart, which I'm going to share on my screen. And if you do not see it, someone just give me a heads up. So hopefully my screen is being shared with you now, and I think you see it. Now, what you're seeing on this screen is I couldn't just show you the Excel spreadsheet and it was many pages. So this is actually a PDF of a spreadsheet. So you don't see all the lines and all the columns and it's just one page. So this is from the propofol case. And what I did is it was like a 2,500 page hospital chart. So I literally typed in the search button propofol and then the search term would come up next, next, next. And I'd go through all 2,000 pages, but relatively quickly. Um, I type in words like syndrome, infusion, whatever it may be. And ultimately, I worked to create, and I had um, people in my office help me uh, to organize it, uh, depending on how computer savvy you are or not. I'm not the best with spreadsheets, but I'm pretty good with them. So I set up a spreadsheet, and you're seeing the printout of page one of a spreadsheet for this chart. Now, over here on the left side, you're going to see plaintiff's PDF page. So this refers to the entry, and I'm always referring to PDF page because chart pages don't matter. All right, so on the left here, you'll see the plaintiff's PDF page. And these are the PDF numbers that correspond with my chart that I have saved in my system. So I know if I go up to the top, so you see up here where it says one of one, it would be maybe 2000 up here. And you could just type in page 290 if there was one, right? And you hit enter and it would bring you to page 290. But this is just one page here. When we got the set from the defendants, the pages didn't match up. So their PDF page 63 was my PDF page 290. So depending on which chart we would admit for the deposition, 
you just want to make sure you know which page you're referring to. And so you're going to want to make sure that the witness has a copy of the chart available with them. Usually they print it out and bring it with them. I'll be on Zoom like this, and I won't share what I'm sharing with you. This is just for my use. But on another screen will actually be these individual pages of the chart, and we'll go through the chart together. So this is my cheat sheet. And I recommend you always create a cheat sheet that'll tell you what page, what date, who said what, and what was entered. So if you look at the yellow, the dark yellow highlighting here, you'll see that I highlight the date on January 13th at 2108. That and I, and I and I redacted names. If any pop up, I apologize. I really wanted to be careful not to have my clients' names, not to have any of the hospitals or defendants' names here. So I tried to be very good about that. But it would be here in the chart where it's all blacked out. That would be the person's name, and then I would put in quotes something that I thought of significance in the chart, and then I would also highlight that on my copy. So right here, you would see I have. Um, I highlighted here, most likely rhabdo due to propofol infusion syndrome. Aha. So we have an entry here from June, January 13th where this doctor or nurse or whoever puts a chart. They think there's rhabdo, which is rhabdomyelosis. I'd never heard of it until this case. I learned about it. It's a sign or symptom that can occur in propofol infusion syndrome. Basically, the muscles get really firm and tight. And it usually happens from either blunt, severe trauma, like in auto accidents, or in propofol infusion syndrome. So this person, my client had rhabdomyelosis, and they're saying here it's most likely due to propofol. Then another ICU attending the next day on January 14th says, hmm, has rhabdo. It's propofol infusion syndrome versus maybe it's agitation episodes, okay? Um, maybe that's what caused it. So they're kind of weighing out what caused it. Is it his agitation? He was strapped down. Maybe that caused it. So basically, I go through the chart. You can see I enter the dates, the times. Here, the resident made a note saying it's now a lower concern for propofol-related infusion syndrome. Okay. Now, what's interesting here and what I want to show you the importance of doing this is that you now have a sheet that you've learned, you've studied, you've prepared. So you know what's in the chart and who said what, when, okay? Now I wanna bring you down to the green highlight. Now what's interesting here is in the green highlight, this is a note of a resident that took place just about an hour before the blue highlight, which is the ICU attending who I'm about to depose. And here, the, IC, uh, the, the resident makes this note, was given propofol for bronch, bronchoscopy, was given additional propofol. So even though they see this now, the word propofol infusion syndrome we know was talked about back on January 13th, they don't discontinue it. Four days later, um, they're giving propofol during this procedure, and they say, we'll gradually come down. We want to take them gradually off propofol. And I know it's because of these earlier concerns of propofol infusion syndrome. I know from my expert, if there's any concerns of propofol infusion syndrome, you stop the propofol, you take them off. That's the standard of care. Then an hour later, the ICU, chief of the ICU attending comes in and says, we're gonna try and get off this dose of propofol given the possibility of propofol infusion syndrome. And I know this is in the chart, okay? So, and then I know days later on the 18th, more propofol is given, right? 30 milligrams of propofol here, 60 milligrams propofol there. They're still reducing it now, day later, trying to get off propofol, all of that, all right? So the whole issue in this case is we're arguing, it was a red flag. You, you, it's not a failure to diagnose. It was diagnosed that there was propofol infusion syndrome, at least a concern for it. And all the experts agree, at least our experts did, and ultimately we learned the defense experts agreed, that if you believe there to be propofol infusion syndrome, then you stop giving propofol. There's other medications you can do. Because if you continue giving propofol, it becomes toxic to the body and the organs start to fail and it becomes really bad and you can ultimately die from it, which we believe is exactly what happened to our client, unfortunately. So now I've learned all the signs and symptoms of propofol infusion syndrome. 
I've looked at the chart. I know who said what. I've got these notes. And now I'm getting ready to question the head of the ICU who made that note saying, we'll try and get this dose off of propofol given the possibility of propofol infusion syndrome. I also know later on in the chart, I see that the same head of the ICU ordered more propofol to be administered, okay? And I'm very curious, so, is my, so are my experts, as to how the doctor is gonna handle this. So now we get to the deposition. And I couldn't give you the whole deposition. It would blow your mind. It was like 900 pages. I couldn't redact everything. I questioned this doctor for probably eight or nine hours. And I can tell you the deposition started off with the doctor sitting there feeling all comfortable. And by the end of the day, the doctor was kind of lowered in the chair, hands running through the hair, not really remembering stuff. Um, it wasn't pleasant uh, because I was that, he was the boxer who didn't think he had to prepare in my opinion. And I was the one who prepared and knew more. So I knew all this was there. I assumed he knew that he put this note in the chart. I assume his lawyer prepared him for these questions. So now we get to the deposition itself. And I always start off the deposition, and this is, you're gonna create an outline, and I utilize my outline. And what you'll do in your outline is, generally I like to start with background, employment, the typical stuff. Then I get into the curriculum vitae, uh, go through what may or may not be in the curriculum vitae, then I get into the treatment when it started all the way through, and I generally go in chronolog chronological order. And what I'll do is I'll make notes in my outline, go to page, PDF page 359. I'll copy the quotes in. So I've got basically running on my screen this long outline that I have all my cheat sheet. I know to go to the cheat sheet. I know where things are, and it gives me an organization and a flow. Now, I talk about this at great length, how to prepare in general for depositions and the importance of an outline so that you're not frumfering around, that you can be smooth and focused. It's really important to spend time on a good outline. And now I'm going to show you sort of how it played out a little bit. In the materials that I have for you, um, I, I gave you a couple little excerpts from uh, the deposition of this ICU doctor. So on PDF page 15, uh, in your materials. So here I am, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully it'll work this time. Okay. All right, so hopefully you're sharing that. Now, in this, this is, starts on page 26 of what was like a 900 page deposition. So you know this is pretty early on. And my goal here was to test this expert or this defendant's knowledge of propofol infusion syndrome. So you'll see, I go through the CV and I'm not seeing anything. So I wanna clarify, have you ever published on anything related to propofol infusion syndrome, whether it be diagnosing it, treating it, have you done any studies? Have you learned this? Have you taught this? So I've highlighted on green here, some of these questions. Have you ever published? No, not that I can recall. Have you ever taught or trained fellows or residents? Cause I already established he works at a teaching hospital and he's the head of the ICU. Uh, no, not formally. And you gotta follow up in depositions. Don't just leave it there. He said, not formally. And this will happen with professional witnesses who are smart. They'll try and give a quick answer and hope you move on. So I say, okay, have you not formally explained propofol infusion syndrome to residents doing rounds or, or anything? I can't recall doing that, he says. Um, just jumping down. Did you ever recall discussing how to treat propofol infusion syndrome with other physicians or residents? No, I don't recall it. You ever read anything specific about it? I can't recall. Now, by this time, this is pretty early on, probably within the first hour of the deposition, I know I'm in good shape because I know I've spent the last months learning everything there is. And this expert in the field clearly doesn't know a lot about it. All right. So I say, I presume you know what it is, right? Yes. When did you learn it? I can't recall, all right? The reason I share this with you is whatever the focus is of your questioning, of your doctor, you need to establish this. Sort of a baseline. What do you know? Don't just assume because this person's an orthopedic surgeon that they know how to perform an operation on an ankle. Maybe they've spent their whole career working on wrists. So you may wanna go. When's the last time you performed surgery on an ankle? You know, and so whatever it is, 
you really want to establish the extent of their knowledge and expertise, okay? Um, so I leave this here for you to read through, get some ideas on, on questions. The key date in my client's treatment was in January of 2019. So I'm asking before that time, did you ever diagnose someone? I don't recall. All right, were you familiar of the symptoms, okay? Of propofol infusion syndrome. So that's part of the background. I'm not gonna to spend too much time. I ask him for a definition of it. What is it? What are the symptoms? I learned through working with my experts, they all called it PRIS, P-R-I-S, which is propofol related infusion syndrome. It was in the materials I read, my experts. So I asked this doctor, have you ever heard of the abbreviated uh, name for it called PRIS, P-R-I-S. No, that's not something we use in our practice. Well, I'm not saying do you use it. Have you ever heard it referred to as PRIS? Not that I recall. I don't recall that acronym, all right? Again, I'm learning now that I have now learned more, I believe, than this physician. And it's not unusual, folks. It's not unusual where you can learn more or have a better grasp because you've spent so much time preparing and learning. So that's the first thing I like to do, is testing the knowledge, I call it. You go through the CV, you see the publications, you see and find out what this witness knows and doesn't know. And if this person did know a lot about propofol infusion syndrome, great. Tell me, where'd you learn that? What's the standard of care? What articles uh, have you published? I'd love to see them. Because if they are that knowledgeable, then you can probably get information from them that may be helpful in your case. Don't be afraid to ask questions that you don't know how they're going to answer them. This is a deposition. I talk about this in general in my prior CLEs of how to prepare and how to conduct. Depositions are where you ask follow-ups. Why? What? My partner Jason's favorite. Did you consider? Okay. Open questions. Trial is the closed question. Here you want to find out what they're going to say. So that's why you got to ask these open questions. Okay. Now with the five minutes left, I, I think I, I may want to do another program uh, that really drills down even more on this, but I want to share something with you. I'm going to let Kate do um, her break here, but stay with us because we're about to get to the best part of how preparation can really pay off. For those of you listening to the podcast at home, there, a second attendance verification code is POD414. Again, those of you listening to the podcast at home, the Verification code will be P-O-D, like podcast, 414. So here's the good part. This is why it's worth staying around for the whole thing. Let me share my screen, go back to my cheat sheet. Here's what I know going into this. I know that where I've highlighted in green, the resident is saying, you know, we need to start getting them off propofol. I know an hour later that this doctor who I'm questioning has made this note saying we're going to try and get off this dose of propofol, given the possibility of propofol infusion syndrome. Now, what was amazing to me is as we get through the deposition, this doctor doubles down, says, he, he didn't have propofol infusion syndrome. I still have looked at everything. He never had it. It's not why he died. We didn't miss it. He never had it. I still don't believe he did now. And it's not what caused him to deteriorate. It, it had nothing to do with nothing. He basically doubled down that it's so rare, this wasn't it. That was his position. So we're going through the chart. Nope, this wasn't it. This wasn't it. I think when this doctor said uh, early on concerns the possible propofol infusion syndrome, she was conflating it with side effects of propofol. Okay, got to be weary of that. Not the syndrome, but it's typical side effects of propofol. Uh, I think that's what she meant. She certainly wouldn't have put propofol infusion syndrome in her notes. Of course, I did her deposition, and she said that's why she did put propofol infusion syndrome. But he's doubling down. Nope, 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 it wasn't it. So I bring his attention to this earlier note that I just showed you in green. Now here, your, your, um, your resident who you're overseeing is talking about reducing Propofol, that's out of concern for propofol infusion syndrome, right? No, no, he says. And I said, so at this point, you don't think that it's propofol infusion syndrome even now? No. So here's where we go to the deposition. In yellow. So this is the, this is, uh, the first, the, the note that I'm referring to. 
saying was one of the reasons why you may have considered getting propofol to come down is a concern of propofol infusion syndrome? And he says, no, I don't think that's not what my thinking was. I didn't think he had propofol infusion syndrome. All right. So then I bring him to page 133 of the chart because I have it in my notes. I pop it up on my screen and I say, this is your note, right? Would this be your note, doctor? Yes, it is. Let's see what it says. And here's the yellow. Quote, we will try to get off this dose of propofol given the possibility of propofol infusion syndrome. So he's just told me, I don't think it ever was. Even an hour earlier, I didn't think it was. And I say, well, how do you explain this note? Say it, can you explain it? Well, let me read the whole note. Here he gets flustered. So he's reading the note. Repeat the question, right? Of course, now he's getting a little concerned. I said, yes, can you explain for me what you meant by the note? So he goes on with a long-winded answer. And, and then he says, well, there was some concern about the side effects. If you look at the green part here, one of the reasons we're trying to get him off it, among other reasons. And I say, come on, doctor, I want to clarify. Oh, sorry, I named the associate here, uh, the, the resident. But in response to my question, you said you weren't even thinking about propofol infusion syndrome. And now, here's what you say, quote. So isn't this you saying, you, at this time, you actually considered it? I just want him to acknowledge he was considering it. He says, I believe I conflated propofol side effects from propofol infusion syndrome. So he's trying to weasel it out, weasel out of it. I know my time's up, just hang in here with me. I'm just about done. So I'm saying to myself, hmm, I said, did you type this? So if you look at the green, would this have been typed by you or someone else? He says, no, it's me. No one types my notes, just me. And I said, well, this is a computer chart. So do you have to go over? Is it like a drop down where it just happened to pull up propofol infusion syndrome when all you meant was just propofol side effects? I said, do you have to type in those three words? Propofol infusion syndrome. Yes, I have to type it in. So I say, so it wasn't a mistake. You purposely typed in this sentence as we're reading it. Is that fair to say? Well, I think it's a mistake, but I definitely typed that in, okay? Can you explain for me how it's a mistake if you actually typed it in? Now you're saying you didn't think it, and that's when things start to get interesting and he starts to sink down in his seat. So the moral to this story, so to speak, is I was prepared. I knew what he said when he said it, and then, if you find, you start to get a sense of the witnesses just kind of being a little cheeky and not acknowledging what's written in the records, um, then you have to follow up. You really have to follow up and lock it in. And then my whole argument to the defense was, come on, juror, you, you, you sat through here. How do you think this is going to play out in front of a jury? How, do you, how great do you think this doctor is going to be now that you keep saying we've got the top physician who's head of the ICU? Um, so that's how I was able to go toe to toe and ultimately um, get the case resolved while summary judgment motions were pending on both sides, which we can talk about at another time. Now, that's my spiel today on the importance of preparing uh, and conducting a deposition. There are lots of other things for how you actually interplay. There's something called Carvalho, which is a case, which means you can't ask one named defendant to comment on the, uh, the treatment rendered by another defendant. We can talk about all these at a later time or in the, this coming half hour for the Q&A. But again, looking just for preparing and conducting depositions, check it out in my book or check it out in my prior CLE from April of 2021. It was part four depositions. But specifically, this is what I think is the best approach to getting ready and conducting the deposition of a medical expert. It's all about the preparation, getting organized. And don't feel like you have to hit a home run. I don't, I think maybe once in the history of 55 year history of our firm, did a doctor ever acknowledge that he departed from the standard of care. You're never going to get it. It's not going to happen. Don't feel like, you know, a lot of times we all leave depositions feeling kind of down, like, ah, he was good. I didn't, or she was good. I didn't think I got a lot. As long as you prepare in the way that I'm suggesting you do, as long as you ask these open questions and you get answers and you've covered everything. You've done a great job. You've done a great job. You can't get somebody to roll over, but you can lock them in. You can ask all the questions that are focused in on the area of your concern. Then you take those answers, you bring them back to your expert, you let your expert read the transcript, and then you have a nice chat of, 
you got some good answers. This is nonsense. Well, this is accurate or this isn't. All right. So we're going to leave it at that. The next part we're going to talk about in this program is preparing for trial. After depositions, um, you're getting ready. You're thinking about summary judgment. You're thinking about getting ready for trial. And that's going to be on May 3rd. So I encourage you to come back and join me next month as we crawl closer towards the summer. Uh, and again, if you're listening to this on the podcast, um, you can replay it anytime. Uh, you can follow this up. The materials are in the link for the podcast that were downloaded. And now we've reached the end of this first hour uh, where I've tried to cram as much in as possible. Hope I didn't talk too fast for you. Most of you are New Yorkers, so you're used to it. If you're not, I probably need to slow down a little bit. Uh, and now we're going to get to the Q&A. Uh, the Q&A, this is your time to fire away, give your comments, give your thoughts, and I will share with you my feedback. Uh, come on, folks, type some stuff in. You're here to pick my brain. I'm here to share with you. If not, I can talk a little bit longer. There's always something to chat about. Um, I was curious, Patrick, thank you. If you all look in the Q&A, um, I was curious how many defense counsel follow up on these Aaron's authorizations? Because to be honest, I can't recall a client or a treating physician reporting back to me that, oh, the, the, the lawyer for the defendant called and spoke to my doctor uh, or, or any of that. So I was curious sort of how that plays out. Um, Patrick was kind enough to, to respond to my question saying that uh, if their doctors were known to be plaintiff friendly, um, they will usually refuse to speak. Others may speak, but are a bit nervous or reluctant. Um, but um, I would tend to think it's hard to get doctors on the phone to begin with. Um, I would tend to think most physicians are not gonna take time out to speak with a lawyer who's fighting off a case brought by that doctor's patient. But I'd really be curious to get any feedback. I know uh, a lot of you out there do defense work. Um, and I'd be curious to get your take on whether you think the Aaron's authorization is worth it, whether you think it really gets you anywhere, uh, being able to, and actually how often can you speak with treating doctors? Um, I'm very curious about that um, and try and tell the plaintiffs, don't worry too much about giving these. It's not really going to, I've never seen it blow up a case before. Um, yes, so there's a question here uh, from Alexander about making and opposing summary judgment motions in a medical malpractice and personal injury case. Um, while we're waiting for some more questions to come up, I will talk a little bit now about summary judgment motions in a medical malpractice case, because generally people believe that it's one-sided. I believe that it's probably on the checklist, correct me if I'm wrong, for most defense counsel to move for summary judgment and all medical malpractice cases uh, that they're involved in. And if for any other reason, it's to flush out the plaintiff to see if the plaintiff has the right expert. Unfortunately, many plaintiffs will bring medical malpractice cases without having the right expert, a proper qualified expert on board to support the case. They're hoping that they file the case, they're gonna get somewhere, they're gonna resolve it. Then they get hit with a summary judgment motion. And the only way to defeat a summary judgment motion brought by the defense as a plaintiff is to submit the appropriate affidavit from an expert who is not speculating, who has a basis for his or her opinions to say that they believe that there was liability uh, or malpractice or departure from good and accepted practice or the standard of care. So um, it's always done. So as a plaintiff, you have to be ready for it. Once you file that note of issue, Keep an eye on the clock because that motion is coming down the pike and you got to be ready for it. You have your expert on board early. They prepped you for the deposition. You've done everything right. It's no sweat. I tell my adversaries, come on, I've got experts. You know me. We've been around the block before. Are you really going to make this motion just to flush me out? Okay, but be careful what you wish for because I'm going to likely cross move. And that's something that many plaintiff's lawyers do not do. Um, and it's something that if you are a plaintiff's attorney in a medical malpractice case, I highly recommend that you either proactively move for summary judgment prior to waiting on a motion from defense. You've got your experts. Let's go. Flush them out. 
let's bring things to a head. As a plaintiff's lawyer, I'm always looking to move for summary judgment because even if I'm not sure if I'm going to get it, even if there's a chance, that fosters settlement talks, okay? And also, how can the defense legitimately argue that there is no issue of fact when I've cross-moved with my own experts that dispute what their experts say? The, the cross-moving alone, in essence, can create an issue of fact if it's done properly with the proper affidavits from your experts. So I encourage defendants, keep making your motions, but plaintiffs, don't just oppose, don't be on the defense, cross move. That's what happened in this case that I've been talking to you about. The propofol, they moved for summary judgment. All the defendants moved for summary judgment. And this was after I'd already exchanged letters. I had deep conversations saying, I've got this expert, that expert. I said, really? You're going to make me uh, oppose a motion where now I can put the transcripts out and point out the differences between what your different defendants are saying and have it strengthen my case, I'm gonna cross move. So that's what I did, I cross moved. And sure enough, uh, oral argument was, was scheduled and I get the call that now they're ready to mediate. They weren't ready when I tried to get them to talk. Remember part one where I say, early settlements never happen. I was begging them for a pre-litigation mediation, but now they were ready to. And why were they ready to? Because they played the longer game. I played the long game. I had my experts. I was ready to go. And even though it was unlikely, in my opinion, a judge would probably dismiss all of them, uh, saying there's issues of fact, I had a sliver of a chance on one of the issues in this case. And that was enough to say, hey, do we want to take that chance of having a judgment even on one issue? Um, and that's what fostered ultimately mediation and settlement. So that's what we do. We want to get cases resolved. So um, it all starts with how you build up the case at the beginning. If I didn't do this deep level of preparation and research and this thorough deposition, I wouldn't have the material to back me in my arguments of why the, the case should be settled and why I felt we had a strong case. So you have to look at the big picture in all litigation, especially in a medical malpractice case, you have to start from the beginning, work it up properly. And then look, if it doesn't work out, then at least you're ready for trial. You know what you're dealing with. You've, you've, you've flushed out the experts. You know it's all on the table. And they see what they're facing. They see that you have experts on the other side, all right? Um, okay. So let's go into some comments. All right. Um, Amanda, we often do not get a response to Aaron's request unless they are physicians we know. As Patrick said, when we do hear randomly, the physicians are often nervous and suspect. Okay, and that makes sense. Uh, Deneen, as defense, we jump right into getting Aaron's authorizations and doing the interviews. Can't say if it's ever changed the course of a case, in my opinion, though. Yet, doesn't mean it's not important, all right? See, this is good, folks. This is It's important that we see, and I can't say enough, the importance of us working together right? Plaintiffs and defense lawyers. We have to work together. We're going to keep coming back in front of each other on other cases. And there's no secrets. You know, it's good for plaintiffs. I like to know, are the defense processing these? Are they actually trying to do it? Are they getting it? I think it's good for defense counsel to hear from a plaintiffs. What are we doing? It's only going to keep all of us at the top of our game um, so that we can reach resolution at the highest level. And you're not going to get to that point until both sides in a case feel they have what they need to properly assess the strengths and weaknesses of their case. And if one side is not cooperating with the other, that limits the ability for both sides to properly assess and be able to, to discuss the strengths and weaknesses and ultimately get to resolution of the case. Um, all right, Sanford is asking, am I concerned that the most probing questions and responses will help the defendant prepare to handle those questions at trial as compared to surprising them at trial? Sanford, that's a great question. And I wanna really touch on this. I am not concerned. I do not wanna surprise them. I don't wanna be surprised because what if I think, hey, I'm gonna surprise them at trial. 
I'm going to surprise them by showing them this note. I'm not going to ask them about it. Use my case as an example. I'm going to let them just say, I never thought, I never thought, I never thought that it was propofol infusion syndrome. And I'm going to surprise them. Clearly, they didn't realize they wrote this note. And I'm going to throw it at them and try. Well, first of all, what that does is it allows them time to prepare an answer to the question that I'm not aware of. Maybe they'll say, oh, I didn't type that in. That was my resident typed that in. I told her just put effects of propofol. I don't know why they did that. You need to get the answer. You need to know if they're going to bury you on something, if they've got a great answer for something that you think you've got the goods on them and they come back and they've got a great response, you want to know that now. You don't want to wait for trial and get burned at trial the same way you think you're going to surprise them. Let's see what they come up with now. So I am not a believer of holding back unless it's something that is neither here nor there um, that might be helpful as a gotcha type thing. But for the most part, because you're probably not going to get to trial. This case may get dismissed on summary judgment and may get resolved. And how do you throw up? Hey, I've got a surprise. I'm going to share it with you now because uh, I want to move the case. So I much prefer getting the answers. That's why I asked in, in this case, well, was it a mistake? Did you actually have to type it in? Explain for me. I would never at trial ask any person I'm cross-examining to explain anything. That's not what you do at trial because then it gives them the floor and that's a whole other area that we can talk about as far as trial skills and cross-examination. Depositions are where you ask these open questions. You want to know how they're going to handle these issues now because they may flump for around like this person did and didn't handle it well. But if I didn't ask this question about, did you type in the note? How did you do it? Then maybe good trial counsel can get creative and come up with a great response to diffuse it. So you want it all out there. That's what depositions are for. Don't be scared of answers. Ask questions you don't know. Ask them for their reasoning. Ask them, did they consider things? Ask these open questions, okay? Um, Sanford's asking, how do I do that at trial? How do I correlate the PDF pages with the records that are admitted into evidence? At trial, it's pretty easy. What you'll do is you will get a chart that you'll admit into evidence. Usually you'll sort it out with your adversary. You'll all look and agree to one physical copy or one digital copy. That's the best way to do it. Once you agree on the version you're using, then you're just throwing up a page. Um, and then you can even submark it. So if the chart's 2,000 pages and you know you want to focus on the page, that's January 17th, 2019 at 451 in this note. You can make a copy of that page, show it to your adversary, make that hospital chart 1A, and then you just show it to the witness, the jury, this is 1A, which is this page in your chart. Do you recognize it? What do you recognize it to be? Okay. Um, Lisa is talking about how they work with the Aaron's authorizations. They typically send them out, don't always get a response from the doctors. Sometimes you have to follow up. They can be critical to speaking to key witnesses or sometimes the only witnesses uh, from their facility who are non-employees. That's a great point. So if you're on the defense side, you may have someone who is working in the facility and you want to speak with them, but they're going to be like, listen, I'm not employed by you. There's no authorization. I can't. I can't talk to you about it. And that's a great point you raised, Lisa. That gives you and that witness the ability to have that conversation, especially when there's third parties involved. Um, that's a great point. So I can see how Aaron's authorizations would be effective in using that. Um, Jennifer's asking me about Carvalho objections. Do I get those a lot in a medical malpractice deposition? And if so, do I have tips for getting around this without resorting to calling the judge? My understanding is Carvalho is very limited and the defense tries to use it way too broadly. Jennifer, I would say that you are 100% on point. Um, yes, it is used all the time. It's practically ingrained. And I'm sure my friends on the other side that do defense work won't necessarily disagree that um, they're going to use Carvalho as the basis of an objection and not allowing a witness to answer uh, a question you ask. But yes, Ultimately, Carvalho is very narrowly tailored. Um, the case is Carvalho versus Nourishell Hospital, Second Department, 53 AD 
Second, 635, it's a 1976 case. And it says, quote, one defendant physician may not be examined before trial about the professional quality of the services rendered by a co-defendant physician. If the question bears solely, and they highlight this in italics in the case, bears solely on the alleged negligence of the co-defendant and not on the practice of the witness, okay? Um, where the opinion sought refers to the treatment rendered by the witness, the fact that it may also refer to the services of a co-defendant does not excuse the defendant witness from being deposed on that issue as an expert. So just from that little bit of language that I shared with you, you can see it is narrowly tailored. Uh, the problem is that you're not going to agree on it. And I will often be in a situation where defense counsel is not going to let the doctor answer the question. Nope, objection, Carvalho. And I'll say, well, this isn't a co-defendant I'm asking about. Nope, Carvalho. <laughs> I'll say, well, I'm not asking about treatment. Nope, Carvalho. Take it to the judge. And unlike federal court and state court, good luck with getting the judge on the line. Um, so what I try and do is dance around it as much as possible. Um, try and work it out with my adversary if I can. If not, you mark it for a ruling. And if it's truly something that's important to you, then you have to make a motion. Um, and I have seen cases where judges will um, direct a doctor to go back and be questioned uh, and answer those questions. So I try and say that also. I say, hey, look, you know, I'll go off the record and I'll say, listen, adversary, I'm going to follow up. You know, I'll I'll try and work something out with you. Uh, so that you don't have to drag this witness back. I don't want to you know, have to do that. But, but the reality is, as a practitioner, you're going to see Carvalho a lot. It'll be asserted improperly a lot. Not much you can do about it. Um, do the best you can. Maybe bring a copy of the case, make a really good record. Say, can you show me where in this opinion it says that this question is not appropriate? Um, that's what I would suggest. If it's really important, flush out the record on the record show the opportunities you're giving your adversary to allow the question, because that's good fodder for oral argument. And the judge may not be happy if they see that Carvalho is being utilized as a shield uh, inappropriately. Um, so that's one way to sort of handle it. You know, say, hey, I don't wanna be the bad one. I don't wanna have to drive this doctor back. Um, okay, so we've got a little bit of time left. Um, let me see what I can pick up. Thank you to all of you for your comments. Um, Catherine is asking, what tips, aside from requesting the witness's notes be transcribed, can you give for efficiently deposing a physician when the exhibit being reviewed is a handwritten note, which is extensive? Does the advice change when considering rules and regulations? You know, this is just going to be a practical thing, Catherine. If you really can't figure it out, I would reach out to your adversary and say, I really need to sort this out. Otherwise, we're gonna spend a lot of time. Are you open to this? Are you open to speaking with your witness? It would really be helpful. I'd really appreciate it. If you have a nice relationship, which you should, which I recommend is why we all need to get along, they may say, I don't wanna spend an hour of this deposition having the witness reading it. But if you get a response saying, no, we're not doing that. We're not required, good luck then. You say, I did ask, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna to have to ask you to slowly interpret and read out everything you've written in this note. And then you may need to take time to review it and then continue on, but that's the best you can do if it's hand scribble. Um, all right, Matthew, thank you for your comment. Uh, Robin is saying that she used to work with my dad, Guy. Uh, they were opposing counsel. And you're sending him best regards and wishing us a sweet Passover. Thank you, Robin. I believe my dad, if he didn't get bored of listening to me, uh, is on this. He can maybe figure out and drop something in the Q&A. Uh, but shout out to my dad. Thanks for tuning in uh, for this uh, webinar. And I'll certainly pass your good wishes along. Uh, Vito, thank you uh, for the great feedback. Um, he's suggesting challenge the objection under the new deposition rules. Again, there's lots of rules that talk about what needs to be allowed. It doesn't mean that they're followed. You'd all be amazed about all these rules that we're all supposed to be complying with and no one ever does. And the judges don't really enforce it too hard, uh, but such is the practice of law. So with that, I think I've sort of hit my end here. I wanna thank everybody for hanging in there. Thank you so much for your participation in these programs. 
and for helping to better the profession by way of your participation. I'm gonna let Kate get the last word and let you all get your credit, answer whatever what you have to. If you're listening on the podcast, uh, thank you for being a listener. Uh, please give me a positive review. If none of you, uh, or if there's some of you who have yet to schedule a one-on-one meeting with me, it's complimentary to members of the bar, 30 minutes, we can talk about anything, be happy to do so. Just go to the Mentor ESQ website to schedule that. Check out my book if you'd like. And um, I look forward to speaking to you all um, next month, a few days before Cinco de Mayo, uh, talking more about medical malpractice cases. Have a great rest of the month.